Hey everyone, I'm Mike Dalpretti, and I'm here to talk to you about some things this morning. So I want to start out with a question, a profitability question. So in the world of real estate and disruption, these four companies get talked about more than any others. Zillow, Redfin, Open Door, and Compass. So raise a hands. How many people think all four of these companies are profitable? How about all three? Three companies? All right, two? One? Got some hands? Zero? Got some hands, all right. So the correct answer is zero. None of these big disruptors in real estate tech that we talk about all the time are profitable. On Zillow's last earning call, there was an interesting quote. We must show you that we're not just buying dollars for 95 cents. You know what that means? So it's like for every dollar that Zillow gets in in revenue, they're spending 95 cents of expenses to get that, right? It's a 5% profit margin. I thought that was interesting. So I looked at kind of, I wanted to look at the rising cost of a dollar for Zillow. If you look at in 2018, Zillow was effectively buying dollars for about 85 cents. Um, in the first quarter of this year, they were effectively buying dollars for 95 cents. That's on an adjusted EBITDA basis. I'm not going to get all financy on you, but that's basically Zillow kind of determining their own profitability, what expenses to include and exclude in that calculation. Uh, a number of companies do that. Another way to look at profitability is on a gap basis. That's generally accepted accounting principles. That's what the SEC mandates public and public companies need to report on. Big companies like Facebook, Amazon, Netflix talk about earnings like that. If you look at it on a gap basis, it changes a bit. In 2018, Zillow was buying dollars for a buck 10. In the first quarter of this year, they were buying dollars for about a buck 20. And in just the first quarter of this year in their homes business, they're buying, do uh, buying dollars for a buck 40, almost a buck 40. Now, I'm not saying this is good or bad, it just, it is what it is. And it's important to understand when we're thinking about disruption in real estate, right? Zillow's willing to invest a huge amount of money to do what they want to do. Switch to Compass for a moment. Compass has raised over a billion dollars. Compass is effectively buying market share, right? This, this graph here in pink shows when they've raised these big mega rounds, and the blue line is the agent count. Compass is taking this money and turning it into agents. If you look at company valuations, profitability these days is passe. Um, out of all the biggest public and private companies out there, only two of them are profitable, Realogy and Remax. Um, and, and valued so much smaller than some of the big disruptors we're talking about, Zillow, Compass, Open Door, and Redfin. Just a fraction of that, which is interesting. So there's a new competitive advantage in town, in the world of real estate. You know, traditional competitive advantages, things like uh, network effects, product differentiation, low cost. Those are all classic uh, competitive advantages, but there's a new one. It's really exciting. We get to talk about that. It's sustained unprofitability. <laughs> These big disruptors are spending huge amounts of money. They're they are investing and unprofitable uh, to some degree with very large amounts for long, long, long periods of time. So if you're competing against any of these companies, that's what you're competing against. Can you do the same thing? So there's, there's the biggest disruption occurring in real estate is financial disruption. Or as I say, red is the new black. <laughs> wow, thanks. My, my family didn't think that one would work. Um, so let's shift gears. Let's talk about iBuyers. Um, so if you saw me on stage last time or you follow some of my work, you'll have seen this. In 2018, iBuyers accounted for about 0.2% national market share. That's over 15,000 uh, 15, purchases, 10,000 sales. So 25,000 iBuyer transactions. So far in 2019, in the first six months, we've seen the same amount of transactions as in all of 2018, all right, about 25,000. So if the trend continues, and I have no reason to expect it won't, um, market share will about double in 2019, iBuyer market share, maybe about 50,000 transactions. So national market share of, say, 0.4%. iBuyer's biggest market is in Phoenix. That's where they've been for a long time. So if we look at just Phoenix, iBuyer market share is between 5 and 6%. You can see Open Door is the biggest, followed by Zillow and OfferPad, effectively tied for second place. Now, before you get too excited, you see the kind of the top line that that market share is kind of fluctuating between five and six, and it's actually going down a little bit. Uh, it looks to be seasonal. You know, we kind of had the same thing last winter, so that we haven't we haven't really hit a glass ceiling, 
But keep in mind, this, this line is not a hockey stick. It's not steadily going up. It's bumpy. It's growing, uh, but it's growing slowly. Another way to look at market share in Phoenix is total number of transactions, not as a percentage, but absolute numbers. And you can see quite a big, impressive uptick here over the past couple months. So iBuyers in Phoenix are buying, over, buying and selling over 1,000 houses a month. That's pretty good. That's pretty good, robust growth. Now, if we look at Open Door versus Zillow, kind of the two big behemoths, Open Door nationally, kind of up to May, is purchasing and selling six times the amount of houses at Zillow. So while Zillow's kind of you know, started from a standing start and they've grown really strong and I'm, I'm very impressed with the growth and they're, they're going really far, it's important to put that in context. You know, the other big behemoth in that space, Open Door, they're also going really big. They're, there's quite a big uptick there. And that volume there is kind of six times. And you see that it's kind of increasing over time. It's not decreasing. So they're really putting the foot down on the pedal and going quite fast in this space. So let's, let's talk about Zillow for a, a minute here. You know, over the past six months, Zillow's a company that's undergone a lot of changes, pivoting, reinventing itself. Call that kind of Zillow 2.0. I want to talk about that story. So if you, w whenever I talk about Zillow, I always start with this slide. This is the, showing the year-on-year -year revenue growth for Zillow's premier agent program. All right, this is Zillow's biggest revenue generator, over a billion dollars a year in revenue. Um, and it accounts for about 70% of the total company's total, total revenue. So this is the main revenue line, right? And you can see it's basically ground to a halt. Growth in that business is ground to a halt. If you're a publicly listed company that's valued based on future growth and future earnings, big problem, right? Big problem. And you got to do something else. You got to do something else to grow. And you can see kind of right in here is when Zillow Offers launched its program, right in that slowdown occurred. Now, Zillow and real estate portals around the world have been on this journey, on this journey in real estate where they're getting closer to the transaction and they're getting involved in more parts of the transaction. So Zillow's biggest peers around the world are all doing the same thing, this kind of move from the lower left quadrant to the upper right. And why are they doing that? To grow, to tap into new revenue pools. By doing so, they can tap into agent commissions, mortgages, title insurance. Now, the reason that this works for Zillow is because consum consumers start their journey on Zillow and these other big real estate portals. If somebody's thinking about buying or selling a house, typically they'll be at Zillow at some point. And that's what gives Zillow its, its power in this ecosystem. And Zillow's built up quite, a, quite an ecosystem and, and established quite a powerful position for itself at the center of it. So Zillow's at the center, they work with their premier agents, and then there's everybody else. The key here is that, you know, I don't believe Zillow wants to work with every agent. They just want to work with, you know, the best, a small selection of them, those premier agents. And because Zillow's at the center of this ecosystem, they get all the consumers, they have, they have the power. And one of the ways they demonstrate that power is by sending leads out, right? Zillow determines where those buyer leads go. So if you or anybody you know have complained about lead quality from Zillow over the past year, Think about it this way, you know, the overall quality of leads in America has not gone down over the past year. Home sellers have not gotten weirder or dumber or anything like that. That's Zillow determining who gets what leads and how they're valued, right? Zillow's at the center. They have that, that powerful center position in this ecosystem they've built. It's incredibly powerful and it's because consumers start at Zillow. So if, if it were me, you know, I would think about Zillow's guiding strategic principle, it must be consumer's first stop. That's where they derive their entire competitive advantage from. So Zillow's doing that, everything's going fine, then along comes Open Door. Open Door, the premier iBuyer a couple of years ago. And what happened is consumers started to go to Open Door first. They started to get offers on their home. They didn't go to Zillow, they started going to Open Door. And that's really this transition of kind of iBuying being the new Zestimate. You know, what's, more, what's a more accurate or better estimate or valuation of your home than an actual offer? A piece of paper with a number on it that you can sign. It's better than an estimate. It's better than an algorithm. So iBuying is becoming the news estimate. And consumers were starting their search, not on Zillow anymore, but starting by going to Open Door. So Zillow launched Zillow Offers. They have to get into the space. And if you go on the website, every single listing in a market they're in, they have their advertisements promoting Zillow Offers. 
So again, Zillow's at the center of this ecosystem, and instead of just having a powerful center position and dictating who gets buyer leads, now they're talking about seller leads. They're getting early, um, early access to all these serious homeowners who want to sell their home and get an offer. And they're generating a lot of those leads. Uh, based on the numbers I've seen, kind of really roughly, you could estimate Zillow's generating maybe 1,500 seller leads per market per month. By next year, they want to be in 20 markets. That's 360,000 seller leads a year. I expect that number to keep going up as consumers get comfortable with this, they get educated, right? Um, and those leads are valuable. So in the first quarter of this year, Zillow generated 35,000 seller leads. They only bought 2.5% of those houses, 900 houses. If you assume a 1% net margin on those houses, which they're not at right now, you know, uh, they're losing more money, but they could be, that's you know, an upside of about $2.5 million. The other 34,000 leads, if you just sold those at $100 a pop, that'd be three and a half million bucks. That's more money than you get from buying and selling houses. And guess what, it's a lot easier. You don't have to buy the house, you don't have to raise a billion dollars in debt, you don't have to fix it up, you don't have to sell it. You're just kind of selling leads. Those leads are valuable. If you go from $100 a lead to a referral fee, kind of what we're seeing with OpSilly and Zillow's um, uh, flex pricing program, and you assume 20% of the leads convert, that's 20 million bucks. Profit potential there's pretty big. If you pull that back into our national numbers, 20 markets, 360,000 seller leads, that's $200 million. Um, it's not easy to convert these seller leads, but the value is there. And the value is there because, again, Zillow's at the center of the transaction. They're at the center of this ecosystem, the start of the consumer journey. And now they're not only dictating who gets buyer leads, but they're dictating who gets seller leads. It's not necessarily a good or bad thing. It's just how it is. I want to talk about the next chapter, kind of what I'm seeing in real estate and disruption. Um, you know, if, if we were writing a book and the chapter over the last couple of years had a title, it might have been something like The Rise of iBuyers. That's all everybody talked about. Uh, Open Door, Offerpad, Zillow, kind of is this disrupting? How big is it? Is it good? Is it bad? Uh, but I'm, I'm seeing a shift. And I think this is kind of what's going to dictate the industry over the next 18 months or so. It's a new chapter. And the title of that would be something like The Incumbents Strike Back. And, and this is, it's the intersection of the world of iBuyers and the world of the traditional industry. It's not an or, it's an and, where things are really interesting and what's going to happen over the next 18 months is right in the overlap of those circles. That's really interesting. So, you know, you've heard of um, Realogy's big uh, iBuyer program and Catalyst and, um, you know, the press releases Keller Williams comes out with what they want to do. Um, but I want to talk about kind of the next level down from that. Uh, I'm seeing a lot of interesting stuff in here. And that's actually brokers launching their own iBuyer programs. Now, they're not actually buying and selling houses. Um, they're partnering with iBuyers to do the buying and selling of houses. But the brokers are going out there with a branded program to say, hey, start with us. We'll help you sell your home, traditional, uh, this other version, you know, whatever you want. Uh, we'll get multiple offers. We'll compare them. We'll kind of hold your hand through that process. I'm also seeing some brokers and agents actually raising money and buying houses themselves. Uh, this is typically in markets where iBuyers are not active, and they may never be active. Too small, too niche, too high price, um, not enough volume, but I'm, I'm seeing that activity there. And I, I think, you know, through all of this, agents are positioning themselves as kind of the center of that transaction. Uh, I hear from a lot of companies and a lot of people talk about wanting to be the kayak of iBuyers. You know, the website you go to to kind of automatically get multiple offers. But in reality, I think you need a person in that process. And agents are well suited to, to be that person. So what all of this is showing me and what that intersection is between the traditional industry and, um, and the world of iBuyers is that agents are actually the ultimate iBuyer aggregator. Who wins? Last time I was up on stage, I asked this question. Who's going to win in this space? And I offered, um, I offered three ideas. Uh, I think companies that offer exponential improvements will win. I think companies that are at the start of the consumer journey will win. And I think companies with deep pockets will win. I want to talk about the start of the consumer journey again. I'm going to offer two numbers, 2.5%. Two this is the number of houses that Zillow buys out of all the offer requests it gets in. That's a small number, right? Small number. Second number I want to say is this, around 40%. In mature iBuyer markets like Phoenix, this is the percent of consumers that get an instant offer before deciding to list their home. 
That's big. That's a big number. Because why not? If you're a homeowner and you're thinking about selling your home, why wouldn't you get an offer? There's no downside. There's no risk. It's free. There's no commitment. If you're thinking about iBuying just in terms of buying and selling houses, you're missing the boat. You're missing a whole new dimension of what's happening in this space. This is what's happening. It's people starting their search with iBuying. You guys remember this? Like maybe your kids or when you were a kid, you know, you play baseball and you kind of do this on the bat to, to determine which team goes first and whoever's on top wins. This is what's happening in real estate at the start of the consumer journey. So if you go back in time, it's realtors. Realtors were the only one on the bat. You're thinking about buying and selling a house, you call a realtor. Then Zillow comes along and consumers start going to Zillow when they're thinking about buying or selling a house, powered by this estimate. Then Open Door comes along. Consumers start going to Open Door. They start getting an instant offer before going to Zillow, before calling a realtor. Not everybody, but just some people, right? Then Zillow reacts, Zillow 2.0. They say, no, no, we can do that too. Come to Zillow, we'll take care of everything. If you want an offer, we'll give you an offer. If you want an agent, we'll give you an agent. Then you have all these iBuyer aggregators trying to get on top of them, saying, no, 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 don't go to Zillow or Open Door. Just come to us. We'll get a lot of offers on, on your behalf, and then you can choose. You can win. And cyclically, we actually have realtors coming back, as we've seen, right? Realtors are trying to position themselves as, hey, come to us. We're going to help you sell your home no matter what you want to do, traditional sale versus an instant offer. Just come to us, and we're going to kind of present all those options to you. It's this, it's this baseball game, right? Everybody's got their hands on the bat. So the other big, you know, go back to where I started here, the other big disruption going on in the space is all this money being poured in. Um, sustained on profitability, right? The big, uh, the big financial um, uh, push in this space. So there's an unprecedented amount of venture capital being put into real estate technology today. That's, that's clear, and I'm sure other speakers today will talk about that. Um, but I think the big, the, I think the big takeaway out of that is that correspondingly, there's also an unprecedented amount of money being spent on marketing and advertising. So what I mean is, you know, if a company raises lots of money, they're spending it. They're spending it on marketing and advertising. And that's being directed at consumers, all right? Consumers are being educated at a scale never seen before. They're seeing the TV commercials, they're hearing the radio ads, they're seeing the online advertisements. They're being educated about all these options that they have to buy and sell their home. That's never happened before to, at this scale, right? So I, I think you know, the, the key takeaway out of all of that is if we think about who wins in this space, and, and the next slide is a, is a quote, and it's very easy to look at it and say, OK, yeah, yeah, consumer choice, that's great. But there's a depth to it. If you think about it, and you think about it compared to the businesses I've talked about today, the companies today, your company, anybody out there, there's, there's a new depth to it. So at the end of the day, I think the companies and agents that win are going to be those that empower consumers to make the choice that's right for them. Thanks very much, guys. My pleasure. Boom.